Last week we began a lesson dealing with the Holy Spirit baptism. Actually, the fatal error of present day Holy Spirit baptism, but in order to see the fatal error of it, of present day Holy Spirit baptism, we have to understand what Holy Spirit baptism is all about. And while we have through the years, debated Pentecostals on the uh, subject of miraculous powers, and they would always appeal to the aspect of Holy Spirit baptism. Uh, sadly, we are now seeing members of the church accepting the same basic principle upon which the Pentecostals base their miraculous powers today, and that is present-day Holy Spirit baptism. And so we began looking at John, or excuse me, uh, Joel 2, verses 28 and 29 last week, and Joel's prophecy of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon all flesh. And some equating that with Holy Spirit baptism. But Joel while he's speaking of the New Testament age, uh, he's not talking about Holy Spirit baptism, but he's simply the Spirit being poured out upon all flesh. We looked at that all flesh, that it is a representative statement, uh, that obviously it's not going to include animal flesh, obviously it's not going to include all human flesh even because it's not going to include atheists, agnostics, skeptics, God-haters, heathens, and on and on we could go with the list. It's certainly not going to include those. So all flesh is a representative statement. It's a representative statement that the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon some individuals. And that it would be done without regard to sex, without regard to age, without regard to social distinctions. We move from that to John's promise in Matthew 3 and verse 11. And this is the first time we're introduced to the subject of Holy Spirit baptism. But we noted that there are two other baptisms that are involved in this context. There's the baptism of water unto repentance for the remission of sins, which was John's baptism, and then there, there's the baptism of fire. Baptism of fire being, of course, the baptism of eternal punishment, as is seen by the context in verse 10 and verse 12. However, there are many, especially those who want to advocate present-day Holy Spirit baptism, who only see two baptisms in this. They see Holy Spirit baptism, and they see baptism with fire. And they just simply overlook or ignore John's baptizing in water. And in this, they oftentimes appeal to the word you and John's use of you. That this one that's coming after him, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so they catch upon that you and say that everyone will receive either Holy Spirit baptism or they will receive baptism of fire. But again, as we looked at last week a little bit more in detail, the you is generic. It's just like the all flesh of Joel's prophecy. And it's really, some of you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, some of you will be baptized in fire. Uh, but those who want to equate the two, one of the things that they ignore is that given their position, if you're taking their position now, then they either have to go to and advocate the impossibility of apostasy or give up their doctrine. 
because if they receive Holy Spirit baptism, then they cannot receive baptism of fire. So now then you have that doctrine of once saved, always saved. If you receive this Holy Spirit baptism, you're not going to receive the other one. You've got the impossibility of apostasy. But also, one thing that they overlook is that baptism of fire is an end time event. When Christ comes again, they would argue that then they would recognize that some of them are going to receive baptism of fire. That is eternal punishment. But for their parallel to hold true, if baptism of fire is an end time event, then Holy Spirit baptism also has to be an end time event. And so, but yet they're not ready to admit that because they want present day Holy Spirit baptism. Really what we have to do when we start studying this is we have to look for further revelation as to who is going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that brings us to where we left off And we want to go to John chapters 14, 15, and 16. This is Jesus' conference with his apostles. It's just before he is going to be arrested and put to death. And so he calls his apostles to him, and he's going to talk to them and give them comfort and let them know a few things that are going to be taking place. But it's a meeting with his apostles. In this meeting, and let me just add, it does an injustice to the scriptures to take what Jesus says to his apostles and apply it to other individuals. If we can take what Jesus said to a specific person or group of people and apply it to others indiscriminately, then why can't you take God's command to Noah to build an ark? Are all of you ready to go out and start building an ark? Well, obviously we think (laughs) that's foolishness. Why? Because we immediately recognize that God told Noah to do that. Well, the same principle. If Jesus is saying, this is to you, then by what right do we have to take it and apply it to someone else? Whether it's us or anyone else. And so it's first, very first thing is an understanding that Jesus is meeting with his apostles. If you look at chapter 14, And let's start in verse 15 through verse 17. And obviously we don't have time to go through and exegete the entire three chapters. Uh, This is going to be long enough as it is, you're probably saying. So we do want to look at certain passages, though, in this. In verses 15 through 17 of chapter 14, he says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I emphasize the aspect when he says, I'll pray the Father, and he shall give you, and he's talking to his apostles. He's not talking to us. He's not talking to, if you want to look at the church at Rome, he's not talking about the church at Galatia, or the Galatian churches or the Ephesian church or any of these others. He's talking to his apostles. And so when he says, I'm going to pray the Father and he's going to give you another comforter. So he's going to promise them And he identifies later on in this context, actually, that that comforter is going to be the Holy Spirit. 
And so he is promising his Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he will come to them and abide with them and that he will dwell with them and shall be in them. That's not us, that's the apostles. Skip over to chapter 16 though. And John, or Jesus, is going to tell the apostles now the Spirit's work. What is the work of the Spirit? We know that when Christ came to this world, his work was to die upon the cross. And everything that he did within his life was looking forward to that death. That was his work. What's the Spirit's work in coming to the apostles? Well, Jesus tells them here in chapter 16, starting in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they, go, they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall, be, shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. The work that Jesus sets forth that the Holy Spirit would be performing is basically singular in nature with three aspects of it. That work of the Spirit is going to be to, and the King James uses the word, reprove. Uh, later translations use the word convict. And so he is going to reprove or convict the world. That's his work. Now then there's going to be three areas in which he reproves or convicts the world. He's going to reprove or convict the world first of sin. Second of righteousness. And third of judgment. So those are the three areas of his work. His work is to reprove or convict the world. It's much like, and many times, you know, we hear preachers in talking about the work of the church or the mission of the church, and they'll say it's threefold. Well, really, it's not. It's singular in nature. The work of the church is to save souls. That's the work of the church. Now then it's done through three avenues or three ways. That is preaching to the lost, edifying the saved, and benevolence. But it's singular in nature. So it is with the Holy Spirit's work as what Jesus is revealing to the apostles. It is reproving the world or convicting the world. Now then, it's those three areas of sin, of judgment, and of, or of righteousness and of judgment. Those are the three areas in which he is going to convict the world. Jesus also now needs to reveal to the apostles how is the Spirit going to accomplish this work. Okay, we know what the work of the Spirit is to reprove the world, convict the world of sin, righteousness, judgment. How is he going to accomplish that? Well, Jesus reveals that to us. Turn back into chapter 14. And first we'll notice verse 25 and 26. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and shall bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. 
I said later on in the context of these three chapters, Jesus would identify that that comforter would be the Holy Spirit. Well, here you see it. But the comforter, in verse 26, which is the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Jesus says, I'm going to send this, this comforter to you. Who is that comforter? He is the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. What's his work? To reprove or convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. How is he going to accomplish it? Well, we're learning now how he's going to accomplish it, but let's notice two other passages within this context, and then we'll draw a conclusion of all three of these uh, passages. Look in chapter 15 and verse 26 now. But when the Comforter is come, now who's the Comforter? That's the Holy Ghost. When he has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And then turn back over to chapter 16, and we'll look at verse 12 and verse 13. Because here he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Now just as an aside here, kind of take another direction for just a second. You know, this is that free part that you get. Sometimes we get impatient with people. They ought to learn faster. They ought to pick these things up. They ought to know these things. Jesus had been with his apostles now approximately three and a half years. And at the end, and Jesus, you know, it, it, you've got to admit he's the master teacher, probably the best teacher that's ever lived upon the face of the earth. He's been with these men three and a half years, very closely intimate, intimate with them. And now at the end of those three and a half years, right before he's going to die, he says, I have yet a lot of things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. Well, wait a minute. If the master teacher has spent three and a half years with, some, with this group of men, and there's still a lot of things that they can't understand at this point in time, maybe we ought to be a little bit more patient with people today. But that's an aside. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. When we put these three passages together, considering what Jesus is revealing to the apostles as to how the Spirit is going to accomplish this work of reproving the world in these three areas of sin, of righteousness, and judgment, we're going to see that the Spirit is going to come to the apostles. I'm promising it to you, Jesus says. To guide them into all truth. Second, to show them things to come. Third, to bring to their remembrance all that Jesus had said. You see that in chapter 14, 26, and also chapter 15, 26. He shall testify of me. He wouldn't be bearing witness of me. Well, thus, here's the spirit, how he's going to accomplish that reproving or convicting the world by guiding the apostles and all truth, by showing the apostles things to come, by bringing to the apostles' remembrance all that Jesus said and testifying thus of him. In doing that, he is going to be able to accomplish his work of reproving the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Now then, when we consider what Jesus has stated with his apostles now in these three chapters, we can go back to Matthew 3 and verse 11, 
where John says, I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We're starting to learn now who this baptism of the Spirit has reference to. That he's going to baptize, and again, we notice that word you is some of you with the Holy Spirit. Who are the some of them? We're now saying that some of you is literally the apostles. And so this prophecy of John, Matthew 3 and verse 11 in parallel passages, is actually limited by Jesus to the apostles, not to all individuals. But as we continue on in our study, Jesus is, of course, taken from them, put to death, raised from the dead. Now then, after his resurrection, he's going to appear to his apostles. He's going to reveal many things to them. But of particular interest in relationship to our study at this time, turn over to John the 20th chapter. And verses 21 through verse 23. Because now then he says to them again. And the them again now then is talking to the apostles. He's come and he is appearing to the apostles. And he said to them again. Peace be unto you as my father has sent me even so send I you. And when he had said this he breathed on them and said unto them. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now notice this. Jesus has appeared to his, or he, let's first go back to chapter 14 through 16. Jesus is speaking with his apostles. And he tells them, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. I'm going to go away. It's profitable for you that I go away or else the Holy Spirit won't come. Now then, after his death, after his resurrection, he comes and he appears to those same men. He's going to send them into the world. Even as my Father sent me, I'm sending you. Well, let's again notice, what was the work of the Spirit? From John 16, verses 7 and following. It was to reprove or convict the world. How is he going to do it? By sending the Holy Spirit to the apostles. And the Holy Spirit now, or the apostles now, are being sent out into the world. So I am sending you into the world. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said... Receive ye the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. He is imparting to them that which baptism of the Holy Spirit of Matthew 3 and verse 11, that which he promised his apostles in John chapters 14, 15, and 16. But now notice also, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain. They are retained. In that work of reproving or convicting the world, part of that was to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and yes, of judgment. Now then we're saying, Holy Spirit, I'm imparting the Holy Spirit to you apostles. And what about it? Your sins. Whosoever sins you remit, they're going to be remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, they're going to be retained. That's dealing with the work of the Spirit. That which he had promised the apostles that the Spirit would come to them for this work. And now then Jesus is setting it forth for them. Now then, just before he leaves and ascends back to the Father. Luke, the 24th chapter, verse 46 through 49. 
Jesus is appearing with his apostles again. And he says unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Now then again, Jesus is speaking to his apostles. This is not a generalized statement. Now then, when we, in talking about that great commission, when we read Matthew's account, we see that that commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel is given to all of those disciples as they are to teach them all things that I've commanded you. The promise that he is making to the apostles, though, is not a command. It's something that is promised to them. He says, you apostles are going to be witnesses, and we'll come back to that idea of witnesses. No one today can be a witness. Just an impossibility in relationship to what a witness is and the biblical idea that's being presented. As witnesses, though, Jesus would send the promise of the Father to the apostles. Not to us today, not to anyone else of that day, but to the apostles and the apostles only. The apostles were to wait in Jerusalem till they were endued or they were clothed with power from, from God. And that promise of the Father, and that, thus that power from on high, are connected one to the other. When you receive the promise of the Father, you will receive power from on high. In receiving the power from on high, you are receiving the promise of the Father. You cannot have one without the other. You can't have the promise without the power. You cannot have the power without the promise. They're tied together. You cannot separate them. Now then, that's important because we're going to add something to it in, when we turn over to Acts first chapter. And starting in verse 4, it says, and being assembled together with them. The them there, again, it, the context is the apostles. It's not us. It's not other people. It's the apostles. He's assembled with the apostles. And commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the, now notice this, the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Skip down to verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea, or all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So notice he's assembled with his apostles. He's commanding the apostles to wait in Jerusalem. He's promising them, or telling them, you wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. Now what did we say in relationship to the promise? They cannot have the promise without the power. You can't have the power without the promise. Those two are inseparable. Now then he's saying you wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. But what is the promise of the Father? He identifies it by going back to John and saying this promise of the Father is Holy Spirit baptism. That's what the promise of the Father is. Now then, you can't have the promise without the power. If the promise is Holy Spirit baptism, you have to have the power in connection with it. You cannot have the power without Holy Spirit baptism. You cannot have Holy Spirit baptism without the power. Now then, we know 
When we go back to Matthew 3 and verse 11, ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. We know, now know who the baptism of the Holy Spirit has application to. So Jesus has now tied Holy Spirit baptism to receiving the power. The apostles, not others, the apostles would receive this power when the Spirit came upon them. The apostles receiving that power then is connected with Holy Spirit coming upon the apostles. And again, you cannot have one without the other. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, and the receiving of power from on high are all connected by Jesus to being a witness, both in Luke and in Acts. The witnesses are the apostles. And again, no one today meets this criteria, but look in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 22. This is after Judas has gone out, hung himself. They're now going to appoint someone, or Jesus actually is the one who's going to appoint someone to take Judas's place. But they're giving the qualifications of this. Notice, beginning from the baptism of John, until the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, whose surname was Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. He sets forth the qualification of being a witness. Now notice, a witness with the apostles. Why? Because the apostles were the witnesses. Now, which one of these two are, are you ordaining, Jesus, to be a witness with us of the resurrection? I can guarantee you there is no one living today who was a witness of the resurrection. There's no one that old that's lived almost or around 2,000 plus years up on this earth. Turn over to Acts, the 10th chapter. This is, of course, the conversion of Cornelius. He's told to send for Peter. Peter comes, and he's going to preach unto them the gospel. But now then, as he begins, uh, look at, start looking at verse 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people, and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Now notice, he sets forth who the witnesses are for us. It's those individuals that Jesus selected, chosen before of God, us, he says, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And thus, Peter has told us very specifically, the apostles are the ones who are witnesses. Other people were not witnesses. We're not witnesses today, even though the denominational world calls it that all the time, and that terminology, sadly, has made its way into the church because of the ignorance of our brethren. 
and we're learning the language of Ashdod, even as the denominations learned it a long time ago. We're not witnesses. The apostles were the witnesses. But Jesus has, again, going back to Acts 1, verses 4 through 8, he's tied the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, the receiving of power to those who would be witnesses. That's the apostles. And thus, that those individuals who received Holy Spirit baptism were the apostles, not other individuals, because they were not the witnesses that were chosen by God. And thus God has, through Christ, given us everything that we need to realize, Holy Spirit baptism. And when John made that statement that ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire, and we learn through study that that you is some of you, not everyone, but some of you, that that some of you that he's talking about is in reality the apostles. But notice again, we talked about the work of the Spirit to reprove the world of righteousness, or sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Notice here in Acts the 10th chapter, when he's talking about the aspect of he's been, uh, wit that Jesus appeared to witnesses chosen before of God, even us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people, What's he doing, saying there? I'm commanding you to go out and do and to accomplish the work of the Spirit. The Spirit's going to be guiding you into all truth. He's going to be showing you things to come. He's going to be bringing to your remembrance all that I've said unto you so that he can reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So you now go out into all the world so the Spirit can accomplish His work. And notice what He ties it into. You preach unto the people and testify that it was He that was ordained of God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Jesus Christ is that righteous judge that we're going to stand before on that last great day. And we're going to give an account of all that we've done within our life. Whether we've been obedient to that gospel that the apostles set forth, they were to show us how to remit sins. What did they teach? Upon the one's faith, they are to repent, be baptized for the remission of their sins. And when we do that, we have the remitting of our sins. The sins taken away. If we fail to do that, our sins are retained. The apostle set that forth as guided by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit doing his work. He shows us how to live the Christian life and that when we fall short in sin, how that we can make those things right. If we will repent and pray to the Father confessing our sins, and we can be forgiven of our sins. Our sins will be remitted. If we refuse to do so, our sins will be retained. And then on that last great day, if they are retained, we will hear those words, depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire. If our sins have been remitted, then we'll hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of thy Lord. God has shown us what we must do, though. If you need to do that this afternoon, to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ or to return in faithfulness to him, and why not do so as we stand and sing the invitation song? Amen.